good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Glad you can join us for another In Deep. It's our chance to go deeper into some things and to really consider what God is speaking to us through His Word, to really talk about some ideas that perhaps we don't get to normally on a Sunday or in other Bible studies. And I just really wanted to take this opportunity to teach you uh, more about how faith works and what's going on, it, on inside your heart when you are trying to believe something. Now, faith, if you follow the story of Jesus, faith is a key ingredient. When there was no faith, there was either no or very little miracles. But when there was great faith, almost impossible to even imagine things were occurring. There are stories of people being healed, being raised from the dead, and again and again, Jesus associated that with people's faith. So faith is an absolutely vital thing for us to fully function in the promises of God. God is going to speak to us here in this word today about how much he's trying to invest from his word into our hearts. The problem is not his word or even the quantity of his word. The problem is the receptivity of our hearts. Now, in Mark chapter 4, it's the first time in the Gospel of Mark that we have any detailed teaching that Jesus gives. So as you read through the Gospel of Mark, you find that there is no details in the teaching that Jesus is giving. It just says that he's teaching, but Mark is withholding the content of that teaching until he wants to have Jesus teaching how to hear or how to listen before he actually presents the content. He wants to kind of create an expectation of something, but even before he delivers what those words are, he's raising your faith by seeing Jesus at work. And then he has Jesus teaching about how to listen before he gives you the words that he wants you to hear. Now, it's, as we read this, we read the whole of Mark chapter 4 is about how to believe or how to listen so that you can believe. And in Mark chapter 4, verses 23 to 25, there's a very clear, in a sense, warning that the responsibility for listening, the responsibility for hearing, is actually ours. So he says this, If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And, it, and he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And still more would be added to you. For the one who has, what does one have? And more will be given. And from the one who has not, has not what? Well, even what he has will be taken away. This is the only time that you will hear Jesus teaching about something that seems to be about taking from people who have less or people who have little. You would never hear Jesus saying to crowds of people, hey, you know those poor people in the community? Go and take away what they have. Because, and the people with a lot, make sure that they have not just that, but they have even more. It just, it, the whole economics of this, the whole compassion of this seems completely out of kilter. Because we're not talking about the realms of human works here. We're talking about the realm of faith. So Jesus says, we need to be the ones who pay deep and close attention to what we hear from Jesus and from his words. Because the problem is, or the result is, the measure we attribute to what we hear, the way that we receive something, is exactly what will be measured to us. We will never receive more than what we believe. But the problem is, when we have very little faith in what God says, even the little thing that we got from it can easily be stripped and watered away. It's not like it's being God saying, well, it's, you're no good, I'm going to take it from you. He just says that it's even if you don't hold on with any kind of vigor to what he's saying, that it'll just be washed completely out of our lives. So... We need to be very, very attentive to what God is saying. Now, all of this is based on a parable. And the parable's simple truth is that God is sowing seeds into us. And the seeds are, are sown to us, not in the quality of our worthiness, but in the quality of God's generosity. He spreads them liberally. And so the parable of the sower reads like this in Mark chapter 4. It says um, in verse 3, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, 
and the birds came and devoured it. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil, and when the sun rose, it was scorched, since it had no root. It withered away, and other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seed fell into good soil that produced grain, growing up and increasing and and yielding thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. And then he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, what you notice about the way that God sows his word is he sows it with complete generosity into all people, no matter the condition of their heart. I, I was recently reading about how a modern day um, harvesters, people who have large, large farms where they grow grain crops, that they have uh, machines, like harvesting machines, that basically run on, um, you know, like GPS systems. So they almost drive themselves. They have operators, but they, they drive themselves in this perfect harvest that happens the same every single year. But they also have sensors on those harvesters that when they're going over a, a patch of ground that is either more fruitful or less fruitful, that that is remembered by the computers on the, on the harvesting equipment so that when the same equipment, but this time the seeding equipment, goes out to seed that field, that if there's an area of ground that really doesn't produce a very good crop, it won't spread seed in that area. It just automatically knows, stop the seed spreading or it can increase the amount of seed that's going in to fertile soil that's gonna produce a lot of results. It, it's very, very calculated because we don't wanna waste seed. Now, God is not like that. You will see from this parable that God is spreading his word to you in his love and compassion because he loves you and he wants you to hear and he will continue to bring these words to you. The problem is not does God speak? The problem is, do we hear? And what do we do when we're listening? Do we recognize that it's our responsibility to believe and to digest and to really hold on to God's word? So Jesus then explains that there are four. Now, four different kinds of hearts. We would all love to be number four heart, which is the one that just simply believes and produces a magnificent response. It is one seed sown and up to a hundred times return on that. Now, we would love to be there, but Jesus is going to clearly show us that that's just really not the way that people are. Maybe human children are like that. You, they hear one thing from God and they just go with it. They believe it, they recognize it, and they're off with it. But once we get out of childhood, or maybe even as we're going through childhood, we end up bruised and battered and with some pretty strong convictions of our own and unable to or unwilling to accept what God is saying to us. So Jesus explains the parable to the disciples later on after this. They say, Jesus, we didn't get it. So he comes back to them with a solid explanation of those four kinds of hearts. I would love to just go through those with you. Now, in Mark chapter 4, he explains this. He says, the sower sows the word. <clears throat> and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And so basic principle number one, my heart can be like a well-worn path that won't accept God's new truth. It's not new to God, it's new truth to me. So Jesus is talking about sowing seeds, and everybody in that day would have understood what a path looked like that went through the middle of a field. It, it, we kind of, in our very well-organized, very line-drawn roadways and networks, we don't really think about what it would have been like in an ancient world like Jesus is, where there weren't like town boundaries and there weren't fences up. There were just a series of fields owned by different family groups, some large and some small. And these family groups would have traditionally owned and farmed that land for perhaps, you know, even like dozens of generations. It, it may have been around for so long that nobody even knows when it started. And in those field networks, 
there would have been common access pathways to go between fields or to other fields or to other townships. And those paths were created by the constant treading of feet. People always walked in that way. So if you'd imagine there's ground that nobody really works, walks on except for the harvester and only once a year and the guy that's sowing the seed once a year, but they don't walk there very often. That ground is not hard packed. But the ground that people have walked on for perhaps centuries is really hard packed and no farmer would bother pouring seed onto a path. It just, it doesn't make any sense. It's not going to grow. It's too hard compacted. Now, Jesus wants you to know this about yourself. There is hard compacted areas of your heart that simply do not accept what he is saying to you. It is an automatic rejection. For some people, it is things that you should automatically accept. For example, God loves you. But there could be this hard compaction in your heart that just simply will not even let that truth go beyond the surface. It's just words. But rather than talk about a few specifics, I want to talk about two generalities. The two most common and most enduring ways of hearing God's word or ways that our hearts, humanity's heart, has become compacted are either one of these two things, either atheism or religion. Atheism or agnosticism is simply the belief that God is either not there or is not knowable if he is there. That agnosticism means to not know something, and atheism means to be they're not God. And these are very common beliefs. You could be watching me right now, and I'm gonna, I could say a ton of things that God's saying to you, but you simply work from the premise that God is not there and could not be speaking, or that if God is speaking, there's no way that we know it, and there's no way that we can understand it or walk in it. There is so much of what God is saying to the world. It could be even saying to you, and you have agnostically rejected or atheistically uh, not even acknowledged that God has been speaking to you. But my friend, I want to tell you, God is speaking to you. But you have to let go of your conviction that he's not. Your conviction is only a hard, compacted way of thinking that you've held on for to for a while. Maybe it was taught to you by others. Maybe it came from your, what you might call your experience. But your conviction is wrong. And when God speaks, it does nothing to you because you refuse to even acknowledge that he's there. Now, the second thing, we have atheism. The second most hard, compacted thing is religion. Every society in the world throughout history has developed a religious technique or a religious system. It not, it, I'm not trying to criticize that. I'm just saying that it's common to people to think that if God is going to do something, that it's going to be in response to my good works or my deserving something. So if God is going to help me or bless me or make me increase or make me better, you and I, because of the way that we are wired with the sinful nature, the, because we ate from the, knowledge, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we have a deep conviction that the way things get better or get blessed by God is if we do good things. Now, when Jesus comes and Jesus speaks the word of God and Jesus goes into the community doing miracles, not one of those words and not one of those actions is in response to the goodness of people. People are not good. The Bible makes it absolutely clear, Romans chapter 3, verse 10, no one is righteous, no, not one. Just in case you thought that he might have got it wrong in that first half of the statement, no one is righteous, he doubles it up by saying, no, not one. We don't receive the good blessing of God and the fruit of his word. We don't receive it because of what we do. We receive it because what we believe. When you believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior, when you believe and you accept that truth, 
then you receive the power of God unto salvation. It's not because you did something, it's because you believe something. And the way of the kingdom of God never departs from that simple recipe. But you and I, we have this strong sense that if anything is going to get better, it's going to be because we got better ourselves. We did better. We worked harder. We performed better. And my friends, that is contrary to the way of faith that is in Christ Jesus. And God is sowing seeds of his grace to you, his love to you, his promises to you. And you keep thinking, oh yeah, I better work hard for those things to get them. He wants to give them to you by faith. So the hard heart of atheism and religion needs to be churned up and become soft again so that we can receive. Now, the second thing that he talks about is something that's also very deep. That is, it's very beneath the surface. These are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, they immediately fall away. So what he's teaching us is that my heart has hidden hard parts that sabotage me during trials. Now, here's the basic premise. Your heart, this is not like, you know, your cardiac organ that pumps your blood. According to Jesus, your heart is your belief center. But a, but a heart that on the surface may look okay, but beneath the, beneath the surface has these rock-like, stony, calloused parts to it, it simply doesn't have enough fertility to maintain what is received by faith through a difficult time. Now, here's the kind of the basic thing. All human beings get hurt. We all experience the pain of judgment, of rejection, of neglect, of abuse, of criticism. Our hearts, in childlike innocence, go out into the world and rather than it being a world like heaven it's a world more like hell and people are mean to us now every single time we become wounded in our hearts we develop a hardness to them those hardnesses those those places of kind of self-protection is very it's impossible for the promises and the love of god to penetrate that and so then the little bit of area left for belief, you might start well, strong, but as soon as a trial or a difficulty comes, you immediately walk away or you immediately give up because, you know, say you heard the word of God say to you, I am your provider. Your heart receives that with faith and you go, oh, that's so great. I don't have to work myself to death to provide for myself. Oh, this is so good that I know I have a loving father who hears my needs even before I, I know to ask them. He's already aware. I'm so grateful that God is my provider. And you leave with joy and you go out into the world and you think, this is great. I'm going to live a different, free and exciting life because I'm no longer panicked and fearful about whether I'm provided for. And then you start to run low. You run low on cash, you run low, maybe you see bills coming in, maybe you see, you know, difficult expenses coming towards you, and you begin to panic. And you panic because in that, that troubled time, that time where your belief is being persecuted by other information, you begin to give up and you retreat, and this is really what's important, you retreat to what you know which is your own abilities, your own working, your own anxiety, your own fears. You retreat into those things. I, I speak this from experience. Basically this, every person who has been hurt finds a way to cope. You find a way to make it through the trials and the difficulties of life on your own, with your own self-protective measures. People are not doing this because they're trying to rebel against God. People do this because they're trying to cope. Every 
mental process, every habit, every addiction, every kind of human practice that we do, it's because it works for us. Now, those hardened things inside of us have got to be healed for us to accept the new truth of God, which is probably why Jesus spends so much time simply loving and forgiving people. He's doing that so that the hard bits of their heart that is beneath the surface can be broken up and they can allow him in. Now, here, I just want you to understand this. Your heart needs to be healed through love and released through forgiveness. If we don't do that, we will always find it difficult to believe. Your heart needs to be loved by God. You've got to accept God's love. You've got to be loved maybe by Christian people even before you can accept the love of God because love has got to be experienced. It's got to be known. It's got to be realized. If you accept God's love, then it helps to restore the broken fears that are inside of you. Now, the other side of that is this. You've got to accept forgiveness for your failures, but you also need to forgive the people who have offended you. If you don't forgive other people, then you will never experience grace. You have to give grace and be released in grace. You have to release grace before you receive grace. We have to give and it will be given unto us, which is what Jesus taught. And my friends, I know that's really hard, especially some people who've had horrific experiences, but the way out for a human heart is through forgiveness. So if you can, find help, seek help, to find out what are those broken, calloused bits beneath the surface that is keeping you from believing. Be loved. Have someone show compassion to you. Show understanding and show a sense of where have you been. I would love to love you through those pains. And then to release the people that have hurt and injured you is a pathway out of that blockage. Now, now the third thing, man, this is something experienced by all of us again, is he says, now the others are thrown among, sown among thorns. Those are the ones that hear the word, so they get the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Now, here's the basic truth. My heart has hidden desires that steer me away from trust in God. So God comes and sows the word to these people. Maybe they're like you and me. He sows the word and we receive it. We receive it in the fruitful, good way that it's meant to be received. You see, in this part of the parable, he's not saying that people don't get it. He's saying that they also allow other things to grow. They also have other things sown into them. And in other parables of Jesus, these weeds are basically the, the, the wisdom of Satan or the way of the world or the things that your mama and your papa and everybody in your culture values. And those things also get sown into you. And there is a competition then between the thing that God sowed and the other things that are of the world, which is the parable. That's what the, that's what the parable says. Now, they choke the word out so that it is unfruitful. doesn't mean that it's ex extinguished. It's just unfruitful. It doesn't produce what it should. Now, here's the thing. When you, when you turn to a temptation, when you turn to another desire, what's going on? Why do those things seem attractive to us? Why does uh, the, the sin of lust, why is it attractive to us? Why is the sin of, of, of greed or, or of, of collecting a lot of things? Why is the sin of vanity? Why is the sin of pride? Why, why are these things so appealing to us? Now, it's, a very, it's a very simple thing. They're appealing to us because they work for us. For example, if you are a person with a self-image that's not healed by God in the sense that you constantly need outward signs that you are okay, that you're succeeding, that, you're, that you are more than just the nothing that you feel. You reach out to these things so that they can support your sense of worth. For example, rich people 
get a sense of their own worth by the amount of possessions or the type or the quality of possessions that they have. A, a person might get a sense of, of, of self-worth from the person that they are married to or their sexual partner. They get a sense of being completed by those people or by those things. And, and Romans chapter 14 says that everything that does not come from faith is sin. So basically, sin is this idea that we can find the things to fulfill us in the, in the province of the world, in the, in the things around about us. Some of this, a little bit more of that. What about that fun, that experience, those things? And all of these things, things collectively take care of me, and they make me feel okay. Well, I've got to tell you this. That is exactly contrary to the truth that Jesus presented. He said that he and the Father can fulfill you in a way that the things of this world will never even touch. In fact, you would feel like the people who seek after those things have wasted their time and wasted their lives because those things are so unfulfilling compared to him. But the problem is we learn through life to make it in a certain way. And Jesus wants to say there is more in the Father and in his words than in all of the wealth and all of the, the good fun times of this world. But you have to prioritize. You can't let those things grow because if riches and the love of riches grow in you, it is in competition for the love of God. And ultimately, you have to choose. But the reason perhaps you haven't chosen yet is because you overvalue the response, the comfort, the esteem that you can get from worldly things. My friends, there is way more in Christ that not just gives you a momentary sense of pleasure and fulfillment, but gives you a heart full of joy, gratitude, and love that transforms you into being a human who consumes themselves with the things of this world and a human that lives for the future glories of heaven. So we have to choose. That's why Jesus says, be very careful how you listen. Value what he says far higher than the signals and the symbols of success in the world. And Jesus says that if you believe like the good field, the last one, it says those that are sown on good soil are the ones that hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And here is what Jesus knows about you that perhaps you don't know about yourself. That your heart can be a fertile field for God's miraculous power. That is the most powerful thing about you. Your capacity to believe. God's word is coming unstoppable. Its promises are true. It is faithful. It's reliable. It'll never change. And it's not going to stop. If you allow your heart to believe what God has said to you and to you about others, that you will produce a magnificent, huge crop. Like one time Jesus healed this lady. She was bleeding. She had internal bleeding for 12 years. She comes up behind Jesus because she has heard stories about him. And her heart has really heard those things, held them, and preserved them. And she's convinced that they're true. So she convinced, she's convinced if she even comes to touch him in the most remote way, the hem of his garment, she touches him, she'll be healed. Well, this is exactly what happens. But in the moment of that story, Jesus stops so that he can teach the broader lesson. He has the woman come out, and she confesses what she's done. And then Jesus explains to her and to all of us that it was her faith that made her well. You see, your heart has the power to unleash the miracles of God's grace for your health, your healing, for your finances, for your family, for your neighbors, your friends. Your heart is the fulcrum where God works miraculously as soon as you believe the miracles start to appear. And you can do more in the power of God than you can do by your own human ability. 
your life lived under your own ability and your own power produces a very small human result. But if your heart allows God's promises and his words to become entrenched in your heart's beliefs beyond the stones that need to be broken up to, to even challenge and rip out those other weeds, if you allow that, then you will not receive a life that can one human being can produce, but your life will have the power 30 times what a normal human could do, 60 times. You will receive 100 times the result because you simply believed God. So my friends, this is all about your heart and all about faith. Seek the Lord. Seek counseling. Seek help so that you can remove yourself from the things that are hindering your faith. Take it seriously. Jesus said, be very careful how you listen. If you kind of hear these words and kind of go, well, I'll just go about my day, then you haven't heard anything. Take it seriously. Get help so that your heart can receive more of God's promises, and then you will see the miraculous power of God in your life. God bless you. We love you, and talk to you again next time. 